Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to Insaf India's Missing Lecture Series this evening, or whatever time it is for you around the world. We're extremely happy to have you here. Uh, Insaf India is a group of diasporic Indian academics who stand in solidarity for academic freedom. We have previously hosted cancel talks by Professor Deepa Mehta, whose talk was cancelled by Mahe Manipal, and Professor Atur Zia, whose talk was cancelled by JNU. Professor G.N. Devi is a thinker, cultural activist, and an institution builder best known for the People's Linguistic Survey of India and the Adivasi Academy created by him. He's one of the people who needs no introduction, but I'm going to do my best anyway. Uh, Professor Devi was invited to deliver an IIT Bombay Institute lecture titled The Crisis Within Knowledge and Education. It was scheduled to be delivered on 31st January 2024 as per the public announcement by IIT Bombay. Professor Devi was informed a day before the scheduled date that the lecture was cancelled by the Institute Committee for unspecified reasons. It is now being hosted by INSAP India as part of its missing lecture series. I am Anantata, a member of INSAF India, and I'm currently working as a teaching fellow at Ashoka University. Uh, so a few of our other members are here as well. And I would just like you all to introduce INSAF and yourself. Just say hi to the crowd. Hi, my name is uh, Jyotsna Kapoor, and uh, I teach media studies, uh, and I'm the director of the University Honors Program at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale and a member of INSAF, welcome everyone, and especially to Professor Devi. Uh, and I'm Lotika Singha, I'm also a member of INSAF India. I'm a writer otherwise, and uh, thank you so much, Professor Devi, for being with us uh, today. So Professor, uh, stage is yours. Well, good evening to all those who joined from India and South Asia. Good morning to all those who joined from the United States. Good afternoon to all those who joined from Europe. I feel very happy being here. And I want to thank INSAF for asking me to come and speak in the context of a lecture that was to be, as was mentioned. It was a lecture invited by the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Uh, on the last day of uh, January. But I was told that it was uh, being cancelled for unforeseen reasons. Now, uh, circumstances can be unforeseen, but I don't know if reason can be unforeseen. Unknown reason is a good phrase. I was very happy when uh, uh, I was asked to lecture there because the IIT Bombay is an extremely prestigious institution. What it has done for India is phenomenal. It was established in 1958 and uh, I uh, and in this relatively short time, of about 65 years. It has achieved a global reputation. I mean, what is Caltech for the United States? ITB is for uh, India and uh, perhaps the, uh, perhaps the uh, global South, I should say, without any exaggeration. Therefore, I was thrilled, delighted when I received this invitation they wanted the lecture to be the institute lecture, which was quite prestigious, I was told. I was also happy because the song, the IIT song, their anthem, uh, is drawn upon a Bangla uh, verse by uh, Gurudev Ravindar Tagore. And that verse very clearly says, it's a prayer. It's in a way a devotional prayer devotional song, which says, uh, give me enlightenment and make me fearless. Now this uh, institute, uh, which asks its students to sing a prayer, uh, asking the uh, Almighty to make one fearless, 
is an extraordinary thought. And therefore, uh, I thought that uh, speaking at IIT would be very good. Now, this unforeseen reason was not stated, but I heard from some friends there that possibly because I had written a Sahitya Academy award given to me long time back, the IIT felt a bit nervous in asking me to come and speak. And I fully understand, I was not angry with the IIT and I'm not angry with the IIT. It's a very great institution and I'm but a small, uh, uh, humble mortal uh, being. I understand their situation. The funding for science and technology in India has not been what it ought to have been. Uh, the, the latest uh, budget uh, sets aside about uh, uh, 10,500 crores for IITs. But uh, though that figure looks quite uh, impressive, one has to think of the fact that there are 23 IITs, which means every IIT gets about 500 crores. Now, if we go back year by year, uh, this has increased by five or 600 crores every year. But every new IIT has been added to the uh, basket of IITs in India. And therefore, in real terms, the budget has not gone up. Science funding in India uh, uh, is uh, not as much as it should have been. And uh, as a result, scientists and scientific institutions, technologists and technology institutions have to remain constantly in mortal fear of the masters in Delhi. Therefore, I do not have an iota of irritation or anger or annoyance towards any of the professors or the director or the committee members of the IIT. I fully understand their situation because it is okay to say in prayer that give me courage, but it's quite different when you are in scientific career to say that and lose funding, which is badly necessary for science research. For humanities and social sciences, it's a different. Now, this is, this is my uh, frame of mind. Uh, uh, when I think of that, uh, that uh, unpleasant event. But the return of the award question uh, coming up again surprises me a little bit because the award that was given to me was given for a book uh, called After Amnesia. It is about cultural history of India, particularly in medieval times, and how India was being made through that cultural history, cultural transactions, through the centuries when Bhakti uh, movement, the, uh, the new languages in India, uh, and Bhakti movement started blossoming up. That book I had written in 1992. The award to it was given in the next year for 1993. Uh, some uh, nearly 20 odd years later, some assassinations took place in Western India. First, the, the Dr. Dabolkar was killed. A, about a year later, uh, Comrade Pansare was killed. And six, seven months after that, Dr. Kalburgi was killed. Dr. Kalburgi used to live in Darwad. And I had gone to Darwad a month before his murder took place. And he was in the audience when I was speaking. So a month later, when I heard that uh, assassins had finished him, I felt very deeply disturbed. Uh, Dr. Kalburgi had written more than uh, 4,000 pages of original writing and hundreds of, uh, more than 100 edited books on uh, uh, medieval uh, history of literature and philosophy of Karnataka. And a very respectable scholar. <clears throat> he was a mild person. So I was quite intrigued as to why such a mild, meek person uh, had to face this uh, 
a tragic uh, tragic uh, attack and death he had received a sahitya academy award for one of his books and i was hoping that the sahitya academy which is a body of writers would stand stand up and say that what had happened was not desirable because his murder was not for property or any quarrel of you it was for his ideas so i had expected that the academy would stand up and more express very clearly that ideas cannot be killed but that body did not respond the way it ought to have at that time and i waited for a week two weeks three weeks uh, i had gone to nagpur the very day after dr kalburiji was killed to preside over a seminar organized by the sahitya academy i was presiding over the inaugural session uh, not a word was uttered in that session about this uh, dastardly murder which had just taken place a day not more than 20 24 36 hours ago so when my turn came up to speak i i requested the audience and all writers present there uh, stood up in silence uh, to mourn the death so i concluded that every writer feels bad about this murder but the writer's body does not uh, or has no courage to say so and therefore uh, in protest against that lack of courage which was expected of the writer's body i decided to return the award given to me by that body because the award represented certain values and if the body is not ready to stand by those values i thought there was no point in holding that award of which i had been very proud now that was between a writer and a writer's body <clears throat> and uh, an institution like the iit should not uh, really worried about uh, what had happened between a writer and a writer's body uh, because it was not a crime to express my opinion it was not a, it was not an offense against any established law in the country to express my opinion or displeasure or uh, or unhappiness about silence of that body in any case that matter was quite old that had happened in 2015 uh, this lecture was to take place in the year 2024 so 8 years later the ghost of that action came back to haunt me i live in dharwad now and i will uh, i mention that the iit was established in 1956 with the money of unesco some money came from russia so between between the uh, francs and the uh, 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 and the rubles uh, this uh, institute made us very proud and i'm i'm proud of the bombay iit as a citizen of india today and i shall remain proud of it as a citizen of india for all time to come a hundred years before 1956 there is another beginning that happens in india and that beginning uh, uh, is partly in bombay and partly in dharwad and since i live in dharwad and i it is in bombay i thought i'll bring this beginning in my discussion today my lecture was called the quest the crisis within knowledge and education based on a book which i had published in 2018 and which was translated in marathi and also in kannada i do not have the english version with me just now but uh, this is a document in public space and it discusses the nature of the crisis that indian education is facing but let me return to that uh, the, the beginning of in the year 1856 in 1856 the idea of setting up new universities in india was taking shape and in two years time india had the first three universities madras bombay and kolkata and these three universities 
uh, were to open a new path for knowledge in India. There had been a debate prior to 1856, 1858 when the university started. Uh, the debate uh, took place partly in Bengal, partly in Maharashtra, uh, in some other parts of the country, uh, in the south, of course, uh, in what is Tamil Nadu now. And the debate was about whether education should be modern European education given through English or traditional education given through Persian and Sanskrit. And so these two groups, the Sanatana and the Nutana clashed at the level of ideas. And finally, because the government was the colonial government uh, and uh, several reports, including uh, Elphinstone's report and uh, uh, Wood's report and uh, Macaulay's report that come, finally it was decided that Indian students in future would join course with modern European knowledge. This was one beginning for the knowledge path and for education in India. And India has, has traded that path, uh, Indian, uh, both in terms of knowledge production or processing at least, and education uh, definitely. At one time at the, in the early 20th century, where we had but about uh, eight or nine uh, universities, we have now close to 2,000 universities, state universities, central universities, private universities, all included. The growth has been phenomenal, to say the least. But I'll return to that. Uh, I Let me stay with the year 1856 for a while. In Darwad, while the university came up in Bombay, along with Calcutta and Chennai, Madras universities, in Darwad, a young boy, a child, eight-year-old child, wanted admission in school. His name was... Uh, uh, Narayan, Eleru uh, 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 Narayan. He belonged to the Mahar community. And the principal of the school, which was a, a, a church run school, said that he could not be admitted because parents of other children would feel agitated. So Narayan did not get admission in school, but the principal helped him in drafting an application, a petition, which was sent to Bombay because Darwad belonged to the Bombay presidency at that time. And uh, from, from the governor of Bombay, uh, since this involved a policy decision, it went to Calcutta. And from Calcutta, Governor General, it went all the way to London, to the Department of Education, Ministry of Education there. Three years later, the ministry decided and through the governor general and the governor, again, all the way to Darwad, came a letter that Narayan should be given admission to school. But in the meanwhile, Narayan had gone away. He disappeared. Nobody knows where he... And his case would have been completely forgotten, lost in history. But for a very strange accident, in 1926, 70 years later, uh, B. R. Ambedkar, Dr. Ambedkar, who was working in Bombay with the government, and he had to write a report on education. And for that, he had to look at old files. Among those old files, he found out, he found a file which mentioned Narayan's, in, uh, the Narayan episode, Narayan uh, incidents. And so he made a visit to Dharva to see uh, if there were any descendants of Narayan there. He obviously did not find anybody because 70 years, seven decades had uh, elapsed in between. Nobody knew where uh, Narayan's family, uh, his descendants were. But in that visit, Dr. Ambedkar gifted the Darwad city with a hostel for children from all poor classes. This was another beginning. Two things happened in India. 
from the 19th century till the 21st century, two major things that happened in India. One, that Indian educational system adopted a track of knowledge which was allied with the track of knowledge that is being described as universal knowledge. Or in simpler words, uh, I, I, mean, I hesitate in saying European knowledge, but let's use the popular term Western knowledge. So India decided that Western knowledge would be useful for the Indian society and accept it. And of course, it opened many new doors to thought. Liberal ideas came in just as colonialism oppressed Indians. The education and knowledge of that time also gifted something to Indians in terms of ideas. But I shall not get into that just now. The other thing that, began, that has happened over the last two centuries is that all those who were kept away from knowledge and education for about 18 centuries were allowed to enter the arena of knowledge and the arena of education. Dr. Ambedkar himself is a brilliant example of how uh, a, a young man from an oppressed family could get so many degrees and uh, come to the very forefront of the society. He was, of course, an exceptional example. But for centuries together, women were kept away from knowledge and uh, the Shudras were kept away from knowledge. The entire agrarian labor force and the agricultural communities were kept away from knowledge. But from the middle of the 19th century, slowly, it is through Herculean efforts of persons like Savitri Bhai Phule and Jyoti Bhai Phule and many others, many hundreds of unsung heroes there are in that department of history, chapter of history. Uh, through their efforts, uh, slowly, these fields started getting opened up for Indians kept away from knowledge and education. Now, what is the crisis that I'm talking of? The crisis is that at present, out of about 8 billion population of the world, as I speak now, perhaps 139 to 140 crores are Indians. Uh, we do not know these figures fully, properly, authentically, because the census has been sent off on a sabbatical by this government. And we do not have exact data. The data that we have is based on 2011 census through uh, extrapolation. But approximately 140 crores. And if you look at the age group that deserves to receive education from five to, I will say 20 or maybe even 25, that's a very large number. That's roughly 45 to 50 crore individuals who deserve education, who need education, who deserve entry in the in hundreds of fields uh, that we call knowledge. Um, the number of these people is very large. It is unprecedented in human history since Homo sapiens started um, uh, its um, advent, uh, since civilization got established, uh, since humans have started dwelling on the face of this earth, unprecedented in that entire history of millions of, uh, of so many millennia, so many millions of years. And yet, there isn't a direction in which uh, India is decidedly moving in order to create an organic link between these um, tens of crores of young people 
and what they handle as education or as knowledge. That organic link is missing. And that organic link is missing because the Indian knowledge tradition suffers from two mortal wounds. The first wound is, of course, the wound of caste operation. The second is of colonialism. Let me say a few words about both these. Homo sapiens moved into what we call South Asia uh, long time back, 65,000 years ago. See, but uh, at least for the last 12,000 years, uh, they have been around uh, in large numbers. And at least for the first seven to 8,000 years of their existence, their labor, labor practices, and their knowledge, they were organically linked. But it is in the last 2000 years that that link was snapped. The knowing class and the working class, they got segregated. The knower did not work and the worker did not know. And that separation then started stunting uh, paralyzing developments in various fields of knowledge, whether it was metallurgy, whether it was architecture, whether it was music, theater, whether it was chemistry or even medicine. And so what had been produced in the past started getting recycled, recirculated again and again in the name of tradition. It was uh, given a rather fraudulent uh, uh, mask of respectability rather than discarding what is old and then bringing in this place something new. Almost for 2000 years, we kept, people in South Asia, kept eulogizing tradition and becoming blind and unquestioning followers of that tradition in the fields, various fields of knowledge. Uh, for instance, uh, we had navigation skills and knowledge about the seas before the Christian era. But when the British, the French and the Portuguese landed here, we did not have competence to counter them uh, to the extent we could have ought to have. The second wound is of colonialism. Uh, I said earlier that colonial British education brought many liberal ideas. That is true. But at the same time, Indians generally developed a sense of tremendous inferiority in the face of exposure to the West. And therefore, whatever was Western in the field of knowledge or education started getting seen as inherently superior and whatever, whatever was local Indian indigenous started getting inherently in, you know, being inherently inferior uh, irrespective of the knowledge value of things there or things here and that 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 psychological uh, uh, mimicry the psychology of mimicry miming uh, continued in our uh, in our practice in the field of education today if our crores of young people have to get some meaningful education then we need to do some new experiments and there is a good history of such experiments it is not as if this evening i am saying something new uh, people for the last century or so have carried out a few experiments. Uh, many philosophers and thinkers have proposed uh, experimentation with knowledge. Uh, all our tall leaders during the freedom struggle had 
tremendous involvement in the question of education. Mahatma Gandhi uh, writing uh, pre preface to Pranjivan Mehta's book on language, uh, language in education, or in creating his own university called Gujarat Vidyapit, was thinking of the true meaning of education. And for him, uh, education was for uh, freedom, not just political and national freedom, but the freedom of the mind. Sa vidya ya vimukte, one who has knowledge will become free. That was the goal he had set for Gujarat Vidya Pit. Ravindna Tagore, uh, another giant, great leader of uh, people of India, their imagination, and uh, uh, who had seen uh, both the worlds, the Western and Indian, uh, set up the Shantiniketan as an experiment in education. Aurobindo Ghosh, who had studied at Cambridge, who later came back to Baroda and, uh, and uh, uh, then subsequently went to Pondicherry. Great scholar of uh, Indian uh, uh, in Indian uh, traditions and texts in the past. Great scholar of many languages, philosophies all over the world. Uh, also uh, tried to create a school of his kind in Pondicherry for a different kind of education. I mean, the, I'm giving only these three, but there are several, I mean, there is Karmavir Bahura Patil in Maharashtra who, who tried to set up his uh, own kind of brand of education. Uh, there in Lucknow it happened, in Banaras it happened, in Delhi it happened, in Punjab it happened, in Bengal, the new, new uh, the, the national college, which is now uh, the Jadopur University, uh, the Jamia, so so many, I mean, hundreds of experiments happen. But the system did not allow these experiments to settle down into a scaled up systemic orientation towards knowledge and education. And there have been knee-jerk changes uh, in where we need to go. If you look at the science and technology policies, there have been four major policies, one during Nehru's time, uh, later uh, one in the 70s, uh, another in the uh, 90s, and now uh, more recently, a, a, a hodgepodge document which is neither a policy nor a good document. Those policies are dragged science, uh, sometimes in the direction of technology, sometimes in the direction of producing more patents, uh, sometimes in the direction of combining management and technology with science, taking us nowhere. I have proposed in my book, that if we want to make the young generation of India a generation belonging to a progressive country, it is necessary for us to think of knowledge differently. When we come to the scheduled castes, the scheduled tribes, the OBCs, women, uh, our uh, uh, our conversations do not cross the limit of uh, cross uh, the idea of uh, reservation. We think that by giving reservation, reserving seats for scheduled tribes or scheduled castes, we're doing a fat you know, good to them. Uh, I do not agree with that. I am proposing that. It is not just by allowing these more than 80% of India's population space in the uh, portals of educational institutions that we achieve anything, but it is their life experience that must come into the field of education as knowledge. That is, we need to link the life and the work of the people 
with the knowledge that we process or produce inside schools, colleges, and universities. And that has not happened. Now, am I talking about Indian knowledge versus Western knowledge? Uh, my answer is very clearly no. Those attempts were made. There was, for instance, Anand Kumar Swami. Uh, there is, for instance, S. N. Das Gupta. Um, so many of them uh, try to bring the West and the East together. But that is a non-starter because the very idea of knowledge in the West, emerging from the Greek tradition, which believes in gnosis or gnosis as the fountainhead of knowledge, is very different from the idea of knowledge that India has had. Here, I would like to bring in two terms from the Sanskrit language, though I'm not defending knowledge in Sanskrit as knowledge alone. Let, let me not be misunderstood. I could have perhaps uh, used a term from uh, uh, Prakrut or Jain tradition, such as Samvega, but it will take me a lot of time to explain what Samvega means. Therefore, um, let me, let me, uh, let me uh, manage with uh, relatively easier terms such as Vidya and Jnana. Vidya is something that one can internalize through practice, through instruction. But Jnana is something in the Indian understanding, whether it is Buddhist, Jain, Hindu, or many other sects. Jnana is something which springs up, wells up. Uh, it is, uh, it is, it is, uh, uh, it, it is inspired. Uh, it emerges. Uh, even in Tagore's philosophy of education, he was saying that, uh, well, let the child uh, find for herself uh, the moment uh, when suddenly the child realizes that uh, the, the, the mind can grasp the phenomenological revolution in the mind allows the rational ability. And by rational, uh, I'm thinking in terms of classical Western uh, definition, the, which, which says that the mind's ability to grasp the world is rationality. So Tagore was saying that rationality springs up in the mind, uh, not, not because a teacher gives the child what the child uh, the child is ex uh, expected to learn. But because the teacher creates an atmosphere in which the child will discover herself for herself what is to be learned. That, that sudden explosion, the sphota, is knowledge. Now, in the Greek tradition, gnosis was also a concept recognized, but logos overtook that. And therefore, Logos became primary. Uh, it further developed on the basis of collected memory. I'm not talking of collective memory, not collective unconscious, not in Freudian or Jungian terms, but the collected gathered memory of so many generations. Uh, generation after generation, the senses gather information, uh, the mind processes, an individual articulates that, another individual joins that articulation. And through that, what is articulated becomes neither mine nor yours, but a third thing, an object or a subject, uh, and which is handed down to the next generation. Uh, so collection of memory, gathering of memory, accumulation of memory become, becomes eventually uh, the shape of an institution the architecture of an institution, of a library, a museum, a university, and so on. Uh, the Western traditions of knowledge spent a lot of uh, their energy in disciplining memory. And uh, out of that effort to discipline, to, to, to systematize, created actually disciplines uh, till the times of Leibniz, uh, who finally formed the formula for bringing all strands of knowledge together uh, by 
creating a higher order apparatus for remembering knowledge. So memory remembered uh, in the, the made ac access to that memory universally possible. And that's what is the foundation of university system in the West. In India, this gathered memory, remembered memory, disciplined memory, verifiable memory, uh, memory uh, which, uh, which uh, is either uh, disciplined memory or not on the touchstone of veracity, evidence, that tradition did not develop to the same extent. What developed in India was the tradition of Gnosis or Gnana, self-attested, self-certified stock of knowledge, which others had to accept on the person's self-testimony. That too is a form of knowledge. I do not deny it at all. But uh, that form of knowledge uh, which operates uh, in the uh, domains of arts and creative expression in all countries, all continents, in all times. But that form of knowledge, coupled with the social segregation brought in through the Smritis and the Shastras, became a became uh, an undoing for the Indian people. Uh, people were left out, and their People were left out of knowledge and education and their memory traditions were never uh, accepted as foundation for uh, developing new knowledge. That's a, uh, that's, that's a subject uh, that needs much uh, longer, larger, detailed discussion. Uh, but uh, I can refer to um, uh, the Smruti Parampara in India as against uh, memory, the science and the uh, magic of memory by uh, Paolo uh, uh, Grassi uh, for your consideration. As we enter the second quarter of the 21st century, I remember with some sadness that the time this century opened, that is the year 2000, 2K, Y2K in short form. Everybody in the world was saying that this is going to be the knowledge century. The last century was the century of nation making freedom, independence, technology. This is going to be the knowledge century. Knowledge is the central subject. Uh, knowledge will decide, no, forms of knowledge will decide new social structures, networks of people, transition of knowledge, transport of knowledge will decide new cutting edge technologies, greater investigations in how knowledge is made inside the brain in neurologies or in sociologies uh, will take uh, precedence in scientific research. When all this was being said at the beginning of the 21st century after the first quarter of the 21st century is over now almost over in a year's time India stands there staring at its face staring at its face seeing how many poke marks there are in the field of education and knowledge I am not talking about shortage of resources. I am not talking about inadequate training to teachers. I am not talking about insufficient classrooms and lacking. You know, I am not even talking about the missing girls in Chhattisgarh and elsewhere. I am just talking about a complete absence of direction. In such a situation, India should have gone in for a very clear introspection to find out how knowledge can be made more democratic and how democracy can be kept alive by using knowledge and education. Instead, India is being forced to return back to the past, to close its mind, 
Indian Indian universities and colleges are in a way made to feel terrified by dictates that unnecessarily privilege esoteric practices and ideas. Indian regulators of knowledge systems and educational forms are inciting even an institution like the Karakpur IIT to print calendars showing how in ancient times plastic surgery and flying machines um, had made India rich. That is a that is a cruel joke on the crores of people for whom the going to school or going to college is going to be the first time experience in the last 200 generations. Don't Indians deserve something better? The answer is they do, but they're not getting it because those who have got education, those who, who pretend to be or who are the carriers of knowledge, the workers of knowledge, the possessors of knowledge, the knowledge bankers, the knowledge traders, the knowledge laborers, all of them have no time to spare, no moment to spare to think about how to democratize, how to build this republic as an inclusive republic this republic of knowledge, as the constitution says about India, India is a union of states. Our, the republic of our knowledge is also a union of so many knowledges. Where is the space for them? Isn't that a crisis? And if we pretend that it is not, can we imagine what will happen to the largest number of young people ever? in the history of homo sapiens what will happen to them where will they go what work will they do what ideas will they they play with entertain in their minds and won't they if we let them suffer under the present system won't the system of knowledge and education won't they then become willing volunteers in destroying what our ancestors, our forefathers for several generations fought for our independence, our democracy, our republic, and our humanity and compassion. That prayer of IIT, he says, make me enlightened, make me courageous, fearless. Will the new millions waiting for something inside the classroom be fearless and enlightened? Is that a question that we have to ask ourselves and do something to sort out that question, to answer that question fearlessly? but in an enlightened manner, without getting into pity this and pity that, without caving in to whatever terror is unleashed before our eyes on us. Time for the Socrates, the Galileo, the Gandhi within us to surface. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the talk, Professor. We will be taking uh, some questions. There's uh, one question over here. Uh, it says that, uh, Professor, you spoke of knowledge and its dissemination. My question is about the medium in which knowledge is spread in a country such as ours, where there are close to 800 languages, many of which are dying. How does then knowledge be given? And second, if the language you dream in or in which you remember doesn't exist, say for instance, a tribal language spoken by very few, how do we then protect our languages? 
So it's a two part question. So many of us think that uh, uh, language management is a challenging task. But uh, if we look at the situation in terms of uh, its reality, the reality of the situation, uh, we will immediately realize that people who speak those languages have maintained those languages for centuries. So if we do not interfere with those languages, they will remain in place. Uh, we do not have to do any charity to languages, but we should at least not be destructive towards them. And uh, the, that, that means uh, there should be no hierarchy of languages in the mind of a learn in the minds of learners. Uh, in other words, I am saying that there is no need to hate the English language or the Hindi language for that matter. But there is no need to uh, to bow down before and the English language or the Hindi language. Knowledge can come from any language uh, and let those languages survive. Should there be a medium of education in school? My answer is, there should be no medium of education in school. There should be education in school. And that can come through any language. Uh, supposing there is a school which admits 30 children having 15 different languages. Uh, my solution is let the teachers and the teachers would normally know which kind of languages are likely to come. Let the teachers uh, you know, spend some time, for at least first few months, learning the children's languages. Once the teachers do that, then children realize that the teacher respects her language or his language. And therefore, the sense of inferiority induced in one's mind about one's language is taken away. There are schools which punish children for speaking one's mother tongue. And in my opinion, there are no schools. There are fee collection machines. So uh, I set up a school in tribal village called Tejgad, where uh, children uh, admit, I mean, the teachers admit children speaking eight or nine tribal languages and teachers have learned those languages. So all children think that every language that they bring to the school is important language. Multilingual education is what we should have. And by multilingual education, I do not mean one plus one plus one kind of just open the doors, let any language flow in. And, uh, you know, uh, to take an example, uh, you travel in a local train in Bombay. Do you say that that local train has a medium there? No, people bring in so many languages, they manage, they learn from each other. Now, uh, similar, similar things can be done in school. And that is where we need great experimentation. That ex kind of experimentation was attempted by Tagore, by Aurobindo, by Gandhi. Successfully, successfully. I have in my limited way run a school for the last 19 years. And uh, I have seen that children learn far better when the school has no medium. I think this having a medium of education, uh, the idea of having a medium for education appears to be a very uh, strange idea to me. I'm not able to understand why there should be medium of education. There should be education. And the language of the student and the teach language of the teacher, they too become the medium for that particular episode of education. Next year, next semester, it will be a different story. Uh, then somebody will say, but what about examinations? But uh, why should examinations have language barriers? I don't understand. Yeah, uh, thank you for your answer, Professor. There's another question. And uh, it says that you have rightly mentioned that lived experiences of those in the socially marginalized sections of society should contribute to knowledge formation. How do you perceive the presence of first generation students in higher education, even if through reserved access, to be able to democratize knowledge formation? You see, when the first generation children go to schools or colleges, particularly colleges, 
uh, we have to uh, recognize and respect that no, it's not just they are getting transformed, their families also get transformed. But there's great respect for such children in the families, in the villages and so on. But very soon one notices that the first generation child starts feeling ashamed of the family and the village. I mean, all of you have that experience. So the, the, if we create conditions where the student does not have to feel ashamed of the family or the village, if there's discussion about her village, her mohalla, you know, in the class with uh, in an objective way, I'm not saying that we have to be praising the villages and the gullies and the mohallas, but discussion about you know, social practices, ideas, beliefs, values, it will be good. It will be good. Uh, in my uh, social science book, in my childhood, I learned about India, uh, about a dam in Punjab, a factory in Bombay, uh, a train track in Calcutta. But my school book had nothing to say about the kind of places, the, you know, the kind of place where I lived. There's absolutely no word about it. It is possible to bring the local in a deep, problematized, complex way at par with the global. I mean, uh, all of us know, those who have been to universities, that the philosophy of Immanuel Kant was born in a village, in a small city. I mean, the man did not cross the border of the city anytime. Never is not seen the world outside. And yet, what you're thinking uh, applies to the rest of the world. We have to figure out ways of doing that, and uh, that will that will uh, that will give people greater confidence. If when people don't have greater confidence about their being who they are, they can be laid almost like uh, blind followers to worship some remote ancient past as a glor glorious past. And that's very dangerous because that that then leads the society into deluding itself. Uh, you don't become, say, Vishwaguru by you know only singing glory of the past that has gone, which was discarded by our ancestors, medieval times and so on, even two generations ago, two centuries ago. So greater investment in the local greater investment in the complexity, social complexity um, surrounding the, uh, the institution uh, will be a way out. Uh, in other words, if the university becomes a curator for the rest of the society and not, not the place of knowledge, the society has the knowledge but the university curates that knowledge. It is possible to evolve different ways of knowing, different ways of knowledging. Thank you. All right. Uh, the, thank you so much, Professor. There is, is uh, there are a couple more questions that just choosing between them because they all uh, toy with the same ideas. Uh, this one says, "Thank you for your inspiring talk." It is striking that you point to the painful reality where there is an entire new generation of first-gen students who will enter university. But these spaces, uh, especially like the ones like um, IIT Bombay, IIT Delhi, are extremely regressive and uh, just follow calendars with Vedic cosmetic surgery imposed upon them. So can you please compare this trend with respect to colonial education? So essentially where these first-generation students are uh, inserted into these universities that don't respect them uh, no. and uh, that leads to very dire consequences. In the first place, uh, I uh, take your question, but I will not 
say that the entire class of students is having regressive ideas. I would rather say differently. After all, they are, they are our young people. I would rather say that they need time to explore and discover progressive ideas. And uh, uh, that, uh, that new generation uh, is a, a generation which needs great care and understanding, our empathy, our involvement. That generation is you know, is coping with very complicated, very complex situations. A, there is a big gap between dreams and reality. The work in the university and before getting into the university has become extremely stressful. You now, after all, the students who have come to IIT have come via quota, where many student suicides have taken place. So the amount of stress, mental stress they have gone through is, is enormous, inhuman. They need to be put into some more relaxed, relaxed situation. As far as the regressive ideas are concerned, uh, no, they need to be given progressive ideas. Uh, no, the regressive uh, ideas of the institution, in this case, specifically government institutions, because I think a couple of days ago, the news came out that there was uh, another student-related suicide in IIT Delhi. And this keeps happening all the time. And the only reason you hear about them is because some of them get too big for the public to ignore. And yeah. almost it, it's very often the case that it's always a minority student. And they have it's all the same complaints about yeah. uh, the university's policies. Yeah, I have I have three suggestions for whatever worth they are. Uh, one, increase the funding for the IITs and science education in the country, which will make them autonomous and not dependent on the governments, because dependence on governments uh, uh, forces senior faculty to freeze their own thoughts and then to, they start towing the line uh, because they want to keep the university, the institution going. I mean, they do it out of uh, good, uh, good interests, uh, good thoughts. Make, you know, make them financially completely autonomous and independent. That is one. The second is The attraction for going outside India is now relatively less. But the opportunities within India are not as attractive as they should be for the IIT students. So perhaps this education has to be ongoing so that students can migrate between life and the institute for a longer time. And that may change the tenor and the uh, uh, the style of thinking of students. The third idea is insist on placement at decision making structures, placement of women and the marginalized classes. Now there will be resistance to it because uh, most of the decision makers have come from the upper classes, the Brahminical classes. I'm not referring to a specific caste for the mindset. And there, uh, this could be made mandatory condition for funding of the institution. Then, so if the, if the funding of the institution the funding pattern changes, mandatory appointments of the marginal classes with deserving individuals, of course, uh, that is uh, that is insisted upon. And the, the, the nature of education, nature of degree is changed to a, a longer term engagement of the students with the institution. 
things will improve. Uh, because those who pass out of IIT have great feeling for the institution. I think uh, their their involvement, continued involvement, has to be formalized, uh, and that will perhaps uh, create a tradition of wisdom, tradition of social involvement, differently. These are three practical suggestions I have, which could be worked upon. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Do we have uh, time for one more question? I think because they're all quite long as well. So I think um, this is the last question and then we'll uh, get to the conclusions. Uh, it says, thank you so much, Professor Devi, for articulating in this way the extremely serious nature of the crisis of not only knowledge and knowledge production, but how this cripples our society more generally. I would like to ask you how you see the role of the oppressor uh, that is the caste or familial and social rules, for etc. As in the elders knows best, as in um, hierarchies, such as uh, respecting your elders in familial spaces, and how they contribute to this crisis in knowledge and knowledge production. I respect Dr. Ambedkar tremendously. Uh, and I also respect Mahatma Gandhi tremendously. Mahatma Gandhi has a good answer to your question. The oppressor should not be seen as inhuman, but rather a victim to be seen as a victim. And we can help the oppressor to overcome this victimization and be a normal being. Now, there are situations which look impossible. When Gandhi was repeatedly asked what he would do with Hitler. And Gandhi had the answer that in under any circumstances, don't hate the oppressor, hate oppression. I mean, he did not say hate, he said resist, resist the oppression. And I think in resisting oppression, when we resist oppression, our resistance, if it is truthful, if it is, if it is peaceful, if it is sincere, and if it is fearless, our resistance also releases, frees the oppressor of the desire to hate, to hit, to suppress, to oppress. That answer will remain perennially applicable to any situation in the world. And it applies to our situations even today. People who oppress are often victims of uh, wrong beliefs, wrong ideas. But we can, we can, we can, uh, we can change them uh, through compassion, through peaceful resistance, to firm resist through firm resistance, to fearless resistance. Your enemy always likes your fearlessness, your courage, your firmness, and your humility. And that reforms the enemy. To be like your enemy, to be like your oppressor, uh, is not the way out of oppression. One oppressor will go, another will come. But that is not what the future needs or wants or is waiting for. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor. I will be capping the questions right now. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we will keep doing this uh, as long as it is necessary because lectures keep getting cancelled and the government's not changing anytime soon. Uh, or at least let's hope so. But uh, anyway, thank you all for uh, joining us today. And, and thank you so much, Professor, for joining us. Would you like to say any yes, parting words? I have one request to make to everyone. Please, please, for God's sake, do not think that attitude of an individual or a few individuals is the attitude of the IIT. Or attitude or attitudes of a few individuals, the attitude of India. The IIT is a tremendous thing. India is perennially there. And we need to be proud of IIT and we need to be proud of India. 
but to make the iit to make india compassionate inclusive is your responsibility my responsibility let's dedicate ourselves to that thank you thank you all so much for joining us this evening